everyone, welcome back to my final session of uh, the art of piano improvisation. Uh, so in our last episode, I look very interesting on screen here, I'm sort of wearing a, a shadow mask, uh, which is kind of cool and very Halloween-esque, so that's very appropriate uh, right now. So in our last episode, we started to talk about jazz improvisation, and we're mostly focusing on uh, the blues, uh, blues scales, the different blues scales exercises uh, that I was uh, that, I, that I was lining up and uh, explaining. So uh, working on all of those, spending time with all of those is enormously helpful in increasing your uh, fluidity and fluency with uh, with the blues uh, in general and manipulating uh, the blues. I also talked about the 12 bar blues form a little bit and how much, um, uh, how many jazz compositions actually use the 12 bar blues form and how much the blues uh, ended up being a, a primal ingredient in jazz and actually absolutely seminal to the formation of the jazz language as we know it. So I also had uh, intimated in the original lecture that um, that uh, you were going to learn more scales, uh, basically, as a sort of fundamental element towards building jazz fluency. And uh, the blues scale is just one of those scales, a uh, very important one, but just one of them. Uh, so I wanted to go over some of the other scales uh, to start with today and talk about what uh, their applications are uh, with jazz harmony. Uh, so, this particular handout is from Mark Levine's Jazz Piano Book, uh, the very imaginatively titled Jazz Piano Book. It's actually a really excellent tome. I both have this appendix and a cross-section of the book from, uh, I think, page 13 through 36 in your Art of Improvisation folder, so you can find them um, all there. Uh, so. Uh, this goes over modes, basically. And if you have had no experience with jazz so far, you know the modes from uh, music history class, because you learned them at the very beginning of Music History One as the uh, scales invented by the ancient Greeks, devised by the ancient Greeks, and then uh, used exclusively for a while in medieval music. Uh, so these are also, these scales have existed long before the advent of written music. And going back to the idea of ancient Greek music, we find these scales in, um, we find these modes, which are also scales, obviously, uh, in the cultures and cultures throughout the world uh, as well. Uh, and that ends up being a kind of uh, primal and primeval ingredient in jazz, that concept as well. So let's go over these and start looking at what some of the fundamental applications are. So uh, I'm kind of going to skip the first one, but just briefly uh, give it a good mention, the Ionian mode. Um, so that's the, otherwise known as the major scale. That's um, how we know it most prevalently, but it was originally uh, called Ionian back in ancient Greek days. Um, and one very interesting thing about this particular handout, the scale harmony handout from the Levine book, is that Levine gives you the chord or the basic harmony that you would use to improvise, um, for which you would adapt a scale, uh, take a scale, and use that scale to improvise on the chord itself. So um, if we have um, the Ionian mode, this is actually a scale that we can use with C major. So the triangle sign in uh, jazz charts um, corresponds to major. So if we take this, all right, we all know it, love it, the C major scale. We all learned it first. Um, so it gives you a, a C triangle here. Always imagine that when you see C major and 
Standard Jazz chart that the major seventh will most likely be added to it. Alright, so there's your major seventh. is a term in jazz that we use to, uh, to talk about a, a note in the chord, a note in the scale that we generally don't want to mess around with too much, that we don't want to incorporate in improvisations too much. And this actually has a, a classical element to it as well. So say I'm improvising on a C major seventh chord. I'm going to exclusively use uh, the notes of the Ionian mode, but I'm going to, for the moment, skip that F natural, that fourth degree of the scale.
counterpoint the contrary motion that makes it work, but moves to a, a subdominant major seventh chord. So four seven. F major seven in this case. Okay. So as I mentioned, I'm just going to skip directly to the Lydian mode, which is the mode at the bottom of the screen. You know that as white keys F to F, but you also know it as a major scale with a raised fourth. Uh, so what I would say, contradicting Levine a little bit, is I never really use a major scale per se when I'm improvising on a uh, major seventh chord. I use the Lydian mode. And that is how we end up correcting for that chord. So that way, and of course you're tra unlike with the ancient Greek modes and with medieval music, you're transposing all of these modes into different keys. So just as I advised with the major scales, this is something you want to do with uh, the modes as well. So if I take C uh, Lydian and add the F sharp, Right, which is sharp four like the Lydian mode, but this time in minor. Uh, 
so we get that tri Again, hanging out there a lot, exploiting it, uh, is something that will give the blues more of a flavor of being the blues. Without that, you just actually have a pentatonic scale. So that sharp four, that augmented fourth, is really important uh, in the blues as well. So major seventh chords use the Lydian mode. Now let's talk about minor seventh chords. For that, use the Dorian mode. Dorian mode is here. Um, we get D minus seven, which is minor seven uh, on jazz charts. Uh, and so what do we get with the Dorian mode? Uh, what's different about the Dorian mode? Well, it's a natural minor scale, obviously, with a raised sixth. So if I play a minor seventh chord, a D minor seventh chord, Scrolling down briefly, here we also see the Aeolian mode um, in all of this, which we also know is the natural minor scale, but we're going to skip that for now. I just wanted to point out that it was there, that it's not skipping anything. Uh, but in a similar way that, that the Lydian mode with its sharp four helps uh, make create a scale for us that fits with major seventh chords. It's that Dorian element, the sharp sixth, that does the same thing with minor seventh chords. Right, that's the coolest sounding note in the chord, in the scale, against the uh, minor seventh chord. starting to learn jazz. A really great standard to be uh, working on and playing all the time. So this is So What, Miles Davis. Again, from his uh, cool school, late 1950s period, like all blues, which we looked at last time. Uh, so What extensively uses uh, the Dorian mode. This, uh, this era of jazz, by the way, which is sometimes called cool school, uh, we know in music history, in classical music history, that certain eras are a reaction to the previous era, right? It's sort of erasing a lot of things, at least initially. So uh, the, in a certain sense, the classical era is a kind of reaction against the uh, twisted fugal complexity of the Baroque era. And in, in the classical era, we get um, a lot more prevalence of melody and accompaniment textures, of homophonic textures, although obviously uh, counterpoint is always there and, and moves back into style. It has more to do with what's fashionable in a way than what is considered valid or, or invalid. So something similar happens in jazz history. So we have bebop, which I will talk about later because it's maybe the most complex of the classical jazz styles. Um, so bebop is very angular with very fast harmonic rhythms and extended harmonies, requires a lot of technique. 
you have a you'll have a one page chart with 30 chords in it that will go by in a minute and a half so miles davis started playing um in with charlie parker uh, and people like that the the legends of bebop when he was a very young man uh, and then one of the many styles that he forged in the many ways that he reinvented himself throughout his career, maybe not created is too strong a word, but became um, associated with and was one of the principal architects of, was something sometimes what's called the cool school style. So as a reaction against the uh, complexity and quick harmonic rhythm of these uh, crazy this kind of uh, playing, um, we have now a chart that has two chords in it. And one chord stays there for a long time. Uh, and it's less of a chord, so to speak, although there's some really important voicings in this, than the idea of playing in a particular mode. So we have long, sometimes very long, uh, uh, manifestations of tunes of compositions that are just basically using one scale. Uh, John Coltrane does this later, uh, and uh, who was in uh, Miles Davis's group at this time, um, and, but is also very much influenced by uh, Indian classical music uh, in the same sense that this is a realm that uses one mode for a very long period of time builds uh, very, very slowly over time. So, So What is a great thing, a great tune to, to play um, as you're getting into jazz, as you're learning the Dorian mode. So let's talk about how, how this all goes. So, uh, the nucleus of So What is just these two bars. That's it. Uh, that's basically the composition. Uh, so we have this little bass line. We see right away it's using the Dorian mode because of the um, the sharp six. Similar sense uh, as going back to the classical realm, the Scriabin's mystic chord, right? They're just so singular sometimes. They, they will have, uh, they will be associated with one composer, or named for one composer, or in this case, named for one, compos one composition. So um, obviously it's just the same chord transposed downward a whole step. In this modal style, uh, another element of the modal style and the way it's used in jazz are chords built on fourths rather than thirds, or in addition to chords built on thirds. So that's something, uh, building a chord in fourths, building chords in fourths is a very important ingredient to explore whenever you're creating anything in a modal jazz style. So we've got the chord itself is stacked perfect fourths. Written out part of the composition, and then you improvise on it. And what 
traditionalness of what became traditional from the first manifestations with Miles Davis's groups is free improvisation on the Dorian mode. Free improvisation on the Dorian mode for, we'll check it out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bars, right? Uh, then a repeat. So free improvisation for 16 bars on the D Dorian mode. And then, let me scroll up here. Then he transposes it up a half step, okay, to E flat, to E flat Dorian. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that eight bars in E flat Dorian, and then eight bars in D Dorian. So really good format to work on. Um, your fluency with the Dorian mode. So I will just go through a rendition here of it uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what I've just done. the E flat Dorian scale under your fingers. It's easy. It's all the blades. 
black keys plus the white key to the right, so you could think of it as C sharp major or, or whatever. So it's easy to kind of retain. Uh, then when I played through the form and got through the solo section, I devised a walking bass with the left hand. A little bit like the walking basses I was showing you with the blues scales last time. Um, I'm just uh, creating something um, that is fluid and consistent, mostly quarter notes, but sometimes uh, a few uh, swung eighths for moments here and there uh, in the left hand, uh, and just trying to avoid patterns uh, most of the time. And then playing short phrases in the right hand to start with on top of that. Just when you're playing the left hand, just get. How do we make that sound not like C major because it's the white keys? It's getting back down to that D tonic a lot and making that strong and making it show up a lot and making it land uh, metrically in strong places in the left hand. And if you do that with the D, then we're going to hear the Dorian mode, D Dorian rather than C major. So that's what I was doing. And then I was trying all sorts of different textures just using uh, these uh, two Dorian scales, these two Dorian modes, um, transposed Dorian modes, rather, D Dorian, D flat Dorian. So check out So What, um, uh, have fun with it. I promised in the last class to just briefly talk about what the real book uh, is for some of you that don't, uh, that may not know it. Uh, when I bought it, uh, I, I did not buy a PDF of it. It was before the PDFs really existed. I bought it in um, the late 1990s in Boston, uh, and I was teaching at the Berkeley College of Music for, for one year, 99-2000, my last year uh, in Boston. And I knew, already knew I was leaving. Um, and uh, I didn't own a real book. I had a lot of copies here and there, but I actually didn't own one despite uh, having played jazz for a long time. Um, so, uh, I asked where I could buy one once I joined the Berkeley faculty, because they were completely illegal then. Uh, the uh, real book is, the, the font that you see in the real book, which of course now is the jazz font and Sibelius and Finale and everything, is somebody's actual handwriting. We have, there are some legends, but we don't really know who created the real book to begin with, except we think that it emanated from um, somebody or a couple, a couple of guys in Philadelphia. That's the legend that uh, keeps getting advanced. Anyway, I was told that there was one person that sold all the real books to the entire Berkeley faculty and all the Berkeley students. And I was told to look out for this guy who had long black hair, he always wore an army jacket, he had a German shepherd with him, uh, and he had these boxes. And he would be out at these certain days at the beginning of the semester. So I looked for him, and there he was, unmistakable, standing in front of the Berkeley entrance, just going, real books, real books. You know, and I handed him 20 bucks in cash, and I, I got my real book. Uh, but anyway, that's the, 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 uh, the legendary tale of why these look like the way they look. Why were they illegal? Uh, it's before all the publishing houses conglomerated. There was no way you could put a single book together like that with hundreds of different copyright holders. Uh, so, but after, sometime after that, you have AOL, Time Warner, et cetera, et cetera, joining together uh, and this sort of conglomeration. And the powers that be realized that they could do a lot better if they cooperated and sold the real book legally. So that's what happened, which is a, a kind of fun story. So yeah, so now you know the um, Dorian mode and the uh, Lydian mode. So now you're fully equipped to improvise on anything in a chart where you see, uh, or anything in your own improvisations or compositions or, or writing uh, lines. 
that are settings of major seventh chords or minor seventh chords. So I want to talk about a couple of exercises uh, that are really good uh, with this. So, um, and using the, let's take the major seventh chords, for example. Uh, so this is similar to some of the blue scale exercises I talked about last time. So um, I'm going to play something now, and then and then I'll describe the exercise. <laughs> Uh, 
seventh chord there. Okay? Minor seventh chord. Only using, it's only using the Dorian mode. Again, you can go start off with a, a lot slower than what I was just doing, but this is to show you um, how satisfying a composition or an improvisation that you can make, even with that, those kinds of uh, very basic uh, constraints. Again, kind of like so what? Um, often in jazz, we'll have a, a certain aspect of it that's complex, like the textural stuff I was doing and the fact that I was uh, not moving in a patterned way from one minor seventh chord to another. Uh, but then there'll be a simple aspect to it, like the fact that I was just using minor seventh chord. You can extend these chords as I was doing sometimes. So if I take the minor seventh chord and add the ninth, which is the second note of the scale, add the sharp eleventh, which is that Lydian element, add the thirteenth. And then you've got, once you get to a thirteenth chord, there is no fifteenth chord, of course, we know, because that seven notes. So um, you can always expand um, these harmonies to ninths, elevenths, and thirteenths by using uh, the mode itself and just stacking it in thirds. So same thing. There's your minor seventh chord, minor ninth chord, and just putting the second note of the scale on top. So what, um, for modal improvisation, this is a tune I play a lot, actually, myself in concert. It's a pretty standard encore piece for me. Uh, this is called Footprints. It's by Wayne Shorter, uh, who is one of uh, Miles Davis's important sidemen that went on to become um, extremely important uh, leader in a Himself. He's still with us, a great legendary saxophonist uh, and composer. He's part of Davis's uh, more electric groups in the um, uh, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, struck out on his own, was in uh, Weather Report. Um, anyway, so the footprints actually uh, comes from before any of the electric era. It's mid 1960s, I think it's 65, not entirely sure. Uh, but apropos of the modal thing, uh, this is an example of a tune that has, we've added one more chord, if you will, between so what and footprints. Um, so it's all C minor 7, as you see here, right? C minor 7. Sorry, two more chords. We have four chords in this. And then we have an F minor 7, and then C minor 7. And then D7 and D flat 7. All right? So, um, but first, I will come back to this too, but I just wanted to introduce sort of the top of the tune to you uh, that it's both a blues and a modal jam. Nice thing about minor seventh chords, and another thing I want you to remember about minor seventh chords, just because they are minor, we can use the Dorian mode. We can also use the minor blues scale, so we can freely migrate back and forth uh, between these two scales. So this 
Uh, I just wanted to briefly describe and play for you, um, and then I'll come back to it after we've talked about something more harmonic. Uh, so here's the top of the tune as we see it in the real book. And this is all we see. <laughs> Sometimes the left hand needs to move down an octave. But experiment with that. If you feel like things are getting into the, in the way of each other physically or sonically, that's something you need to do. So I take this bass line and put it down here. This is kind of a jazz waltz. And this is what I do with the right hand. And this is an important voicing thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, we do this with, obviously, classical music all the time. Uh, but as you're devising something with improvisation or even working out something in advance, uh, often, not always, sometimes single lines, often single lines will be great, but also often enough, single lines will sound a little bit too uh, thin. So uh, I, instead of playing the right hand this way, <laughs> to one of the most 
uh, important elements of uh, jazz um, harmony and uh, jazz education, uh, if you will. It's kind of a cliche, but it is a beautiful cliche. Uh, two, five, one progressions. So in the classical realm, uh, we have learned uh, four, five, one progressions, or one, four, five, one progressions, right? We would play our scales and then play something like this at the end, right? So uh, the jazz version of this is the two, five, one. And it's not such a stretch. Um, if you have theory classes, we know that the two chord has basically the same function as the four chord, right? It's a predominant chord, so of course that completely adds up. Uh, but these Roman numerals that we're using and everything are, um, you know, not always, don't always have a, a perfectly uh, a corollary that's legal in um, the classical world, like being able to resolve on a major seventh chord and not having to resolve the major seventh upward. Uh, in any case, um, two, five, one, uh, in jazz will always mean at least that we're using seventh chords because we don't really use triads in jazz. Two, five, one progression is a progression that you will find over and over and over in jazz compositions. Uh, you will sometimes find, uh, I'll show you uh, at least one uh, after I go through, through this, you'll find uh, that sequence of chords sometimes repeated over and over in different keys in jazz standards. And so having fluency with playing and improvising on 2-5-1 progressions, finding the chords very quickly from the chord symbols is really uh, seminal. And so that's why these exercises, we all teach them a little bit differently. I put together my own sheet here. Uh, so we'll go through uh, each of these uh, so-called shell voicings. That's a, a jazz term. Shell voicings means basically that we're, we reduce the essence of these harmonies to their essential notes, to the notes that uh, are necessary to identify them. So we I just have the root, uh, the seventh, and the third with each of these chords. So here's two, five, one, and shell voicings. <laughs> position with the outer chords stacked up in order, if you will, one, three, seven, and then the major seven on top of that. And with good voice leading to go to the G7 chord, I simply drop the top note a half step, and then when I move to the one seventh chord, Travel downward chromatically through all of these two five ones. And I'm just giving you the first few, and then you need to figure out the rest without reading it, uh, basically, uh, by just knowing what's happening intervallically, vertically, and horizontally. Um, so if you find this a little bit tricky, think about what's happening left to right, and think about what's happening up and down. So how it works uh, with my descent, descending motion here. So every time I get to a one seven, to create the two seven of the next two five one, that's a half step lower, I simply raise the root by a half step. So, one seven in C major becomes two seven in B major that way. And that's why it's user friendly. There's just the, most notes are staying the same and other notes are moving uh, by a step. So, the idea with version one. Just and build speed on it, like I was just doing, so that you can find these chords 
really quickly. So, then version two, shell voicings with added fifth and doubling. So now I am uh, increasing the uh, thickness of the chords, uh, mostly adding the perfect fifths. Uh, in jazz, often, not all the time, but often we leave out the fifth because that just sort of, what does the fifth do? The perfect fifth, we hear the perfect fifth even if it isn't there, right? It's an overtone, it's the most, it's the closest overtone that isn't the same note as the, as the uh, root of the chord. Um, and if we're playing a bunch of extensions, like if we have a 13th, 11th, and a 9th, and the root, and the 7th, uh, then the 5th just can make the chord sort of unwieldingly thick. Sometimes. But sometimes we want to keep in the 5th. Uh, and I'm not, don't have these wild uh, 13th chords all over the place here yet, so I'm keeping it in uh, for part of the time. So here are the shell voicings, here's version 2. Uh, with added fifths and doublings. <laughs> Extremely important voicing. 
after I describe the final exercise here. Okay, so here um, I'm reducing the complexity of the chords a little bit, uh, more back to version two instead of version three, and putting them in the left hand. Improvise on the major scale or the Lydian mode uh, in the right hand. Here, the major scale actually is a little bit better than the Lydian mode, and let me uh, explain why, even though I went through all that stuff about the Lydian mode mostly being a better scale than the major scale. You can use the major scale the whole time, but at least you're going to need to use it here and here, right? Because we're not on a major seventh chord. Okay, we're, uh, so the Lydian mode, the Lydian mode is what you can use, the best scale perhaps, for the major seventh chord. But now we've got an actual progression, and we've got F naturals in both of these uh, chords. So you would definitely start off playing the C major scale. And then you can switch to C Lydian over here, but because you just had established these chords, the C major scale will work just as well over here. So it's optional to switch to Lydian. You can just stay with major if you want to, and it will work because of these two chords being in the progression. But the idea here is that you can be, um, once you're automatic enough with the left hand, that you're improvising um, on the major scales in the right hand. Simple too, that's equally as important as gaining uh, fluidity uh, in both the right and left hand. So, I wanted to go back now and talk about this G13 voicing, the, this 13th chord voicing, because this is extremely important in jazz piano. Um, with the major seventh chords and minor seventh chords, we can play these. Uh, in root position, with no decoration, as we've seen and as I've uh, shown you, uh, and it will sound fine. Dominant seventh chord, it doesn't work. Uh, and 
I wondered why um, the naked dominant seventh chords aren't really part of jazz harmony, of the jazz language, but naked major seventh and naked minor seventh chords are. Uh, and I think it has a little something to do with uh, that naked major seventh and naked minor seventh chords that don't resolve and just sort of move in parallel motion um, are not really part of common practice classical music, so it doesn't remind us of that. But the naked dominant seventh chords are so deeply embedded in the classical realm that it just, if we're using that voicing for, um, if we see G7 on a chart, then it just doesn't have that jazz flavor to it. So if I'm seeing G7 on a chart, that just sounds amateurish as hell. Uh, but if I use the 13th voicing, that you see here, the F-A-V-E, that works. This has become a kind of standard voicing uh, for dominant seventh chords in jazz piano. And it's complex, and this one takes longer to learn and get comfortable with. I sometimes call it the um, 3, 7, 9, 13 voicing, because that is, those are the notes in the chord. So look at that F, A, B, E, where it says G13. Transfer that to your left hand. What's true also with uh, a lot of jazz, uh, if you're playing with a group, if you're playing with a bass player, I'm sure a lot of you know this, often you're not playing down here at the bottom and you're not playing roots because the bass player is already doing that and you might clash with the bass player. Uh, but even when the bass player is not there, it can work often to not have the root of the chord uh, and you still get the identity of it. So if I'm playing that G13, F, A, B, E, that 3, 7, 9, 13 voice, and I'm leaving out the root, but I'm playing in the right hand uh, the mixolydian mode, which I'll get to. G is being the root of the chord, largely because of what I'm doing with my right hand, I think. Um, so uh, I can, if I just do, I'm going to transpose this, this, um, um, this 13th chord uh, into different 13th chords, sort of randomly like I was doing with the major and minor 7th chords. Um, and you hopefully will hear that this kind of works. sort of going uh, at least back to bebop, that uh, again, part of the time, but not all the time, uh, that uh, a little bit of harmonic ambiguity in the most sophisticated jazz uh, that you hear that's still tonal is part of the style, in the same way that harmonic ambiguity, once we get to um, extreme chromaticism in classical music uh, and uh, so forth, also becomes part of the style, but with a completely different uh, pitch language, of course. So that's part of what's going on here. So if you want to get well-versed in jazz, for you, uh, this is just a great harmony to, uh, to know if you want to use jazz as an ingredient of anything that you're doing, is to get to know this harmony and get fluent with it. And that's a, with the left hand, and that's a lot harder. We'll also say that you can you can jump down and play the roof like a little stride thing.
just to just plain the room once uh, like that. Can uh, you can do that part of the time, um, and that can be um, uh, just give you a little bit more variety and sort of open up the register down here a little bit too. Uh, so what uh, what do you do to get this voicing to work for you? Well, a lot of separate exercises that I think are easy to uh, devise. Um, I'll just go through, um, and you can make up your own, but I'll just go through a few. First of all, just... So you have this turnaround here. Footprints is kind of a blues, right? We've got this uh, blues form, or sort of takes the 12-bar blues idea, but it's really a 16-bar blues. But by going to the subdominant at this point, going back to the tonic, and having a kind of a turnaround here at the end. So once I get to 
play the opening, do I have it down to, yes, yeah, so you see the D7 and the D flat 7. So if you just see 7 with no major or minor, it means dominant 7 by default in jazz. So I'm going to play that beginning again, if you've heard me, play the advance. 
um, actually compositionally. I play them the same way each time, a little commentary, but you see that there's nothing going on in the melody here in these measures, um, in these four measures. And generally, the idea is to put some kind of fill in there. So I tend to do it the same thing.